Hey there, Riverman fans. I'm Jason Ruff. Welcome to another off-season and another edition of the Dry Dock Podcast. This is the podcast where we sit down and talk with Riverman past and present about the off-season, about the season that was, and about what they're doing to stay busy now that the ship is, so to speak, in Dry Dock. Our first guest is the only person we could start off uh, this year's series with, your head coach of the Peoria Riverman, head coach John Geetrudell, going into his 10th season now behind the bench and 11th here in Peoria. Gee, joining us from the mobile office, it never stops even in the off season for you, my friend. You look good. No, thanks, buddy. Yeah, it's been a busy off season, but a good one. So really excited about the things to come here for the Riverman. Uh, can't say enough of my, uh, my captain joining me. So we've been... Uh, We've been going at it, and, uh, you know, there's a lot with all our camps also, so it's been a busy summer. A lot to unpack there. Let's start with the big news, obviously, that you're coming back for your 11th season with Peoria and that Alec Hageman, your longtime captain, is going to be joining you as an associate head coach. Why do you think now is the right time to bring Hageman on, your former player and captain on, as an associate head coach and having you two kind of work the bench behind it? Well, first off, it was, uh, you know, it was great that when I went to talk to our bosses, uh, Bart Rogers, that he was in for it because me and Hags have been talking about this for about two years now. Uh, Hags has been helping me in my camps in the summer. He's phenomenal for, uh, you know, youth hockey in Peoria. He's phenomenal for a lot of things that he does. And I feel like he's got the leadership necessary to be become a coach here at this level. And uh, first off, the process started with me talking to Bart and, Bart thought it was a great idea, and then we made it work, and then finally we got everything signed, everything done. So for me, I, I can't say enough. You know, for years, I wanted a guy to be there. Uh, you know, it's it's always good. You, you know, you want to bounce ideas off each other. You want to uh, be challenged every day as a head coach, and, you know, you want to bring people that can take over. They always say, um, if you're scared to lose your job, you're in trouble as a head coach. I, I see it as Ags is coming in. He's going to be learning, and hopefully he takes over here uh, in a soon date. To be, you know, he's he's been the face of the franchise for years now, so I think it's just a normal process for him to get in coaching after his career. And I think what kind of goes under the radar, not a lot of fans realize just how close you two have been, obviously with the coaching and player perspective and standpoint, but now coaching as well. Can you shed some light on that relationship that you've had with Alec Hagman? Do you have a favorite – Riverman's story with Hageman, perhaps, that you could share? Uh, it's not even a story for me. It's a process of him developing into a phenomenal leader because we talked about a certain culture. A lot of, you know, teams put it out there, but uh, we really believe in it in Peoria. And if it wasn't for Hags and a few of the boys we have on a team, it'd be very hard to string that culture every single year. You have to have guys that are understanding into the process. And the process, to me, to win a lot of games and, you know, we always say we want to make our Peoria fans proud to do that every single day. It's a lot of effort. And if you don't have the right leadership group or the right people in the locker room, it's hard to continue with that. And you see it in every team in our league. It's very hard to continue with playing 700 hockey every regular, she regular season and go far in the playoffs. But we have guys like Hags that I can lean on, but also – I can squeeze also, uh, you know, as much as I love Hags, when we had that player coach relationship, I squeezed a lot out of that guy. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, I made it hard on him sometimes and for him to respond the way he did the last three, four years and understanding why we are squeezing, why we we're doing certain things and to kind of relay that message to other players, it just showed me that he's ready mentally as a leader, he's ready to take over. Uh, but I understand also as a new coach, there's a lot of little things, a lot of nuances that you have to know and do the right way every single day to have success. And I'm happy I can be there to kind of be that springboard for him to help him along the way. But at the same time, to let him take over a lot of parts of, you know, of our hockey team to make. I always say you just learn by experience. So we got to put him in spots for him to make sure that he learns. He's going to have some tough times. He's going to have some great times, but you have to go through it to become a great hockey coach. This past season saw a lot of memories, though unfortunately the Rivermen fell short in their pursuit of another President's Cup champion to repeat as President's Cup champions at the end of the season. The Rivermen did finish first place in the league, earning their fifth William B. Coffey trophy officially. I know you say there should have been a sixth one due to COVID, but you also had a number of players come back, Ben Escrova come back and able to have his swan song. You had another also a number of players like Alec Hagman, like Nick Neville, like Eric Levine, kind of call it a career in the case of Alec Hagman, 
earning some big time career highlights, becoming the only player in SBHL history to score 400 career points and play in 400 career games. Eric Levine has the uh, is the sole holder of the league shutout record for careers. What made this season so spectacular and so memorable, you know, despite following up last year where you won your first championship? I honestly believe rougher. Uh, it starts upstairs. I, I, I think, you know, when I communicate with Bart about making events special for these players, Bart has always been understanding how much work these players do, uh, not only for the organization, but for the city of Peoria. And I, I, I think, you know, everybody looks for a reward at some times in their life. And I think when you are rewarded with, you know, Hags had a great, I, I thought it was a great night when we celebrated him. I thought Ben Esprobo was a great night. And those great nights have to start from somewhere. I think it starts with upstairs that they do believe in our players. They believe in the culture we're building downstairs. And they kind of, you know, we just all fit in and we have great communication on what we want to accomplish because without that, those celebrations wouldn't be as good. And I think players would not understand how much we appreciate everything they do for us. And when you do that, you kind of build that family relationship, not only with us and the upstairs, but with the fans also. Because, you know, like me, fans are, you know, they become fans because they see players year after year. And those players usually become the most popular guys and they're always in the community. So for us, just celebrating them the right way, doing it with class, doing it what like you should at the pro level is just absolutely phenomenal. So as much as, like you said, we didn't win the, the big prize. And for me, the most upsetting about not uh, winning it is because, you know, sometimes you don't win and there's reasons like you can say, OK, we didn't do this well. We didn't do this well. I honestly thought we played absolutely outstanding. We can't. I think the last game we outshot them 48 to 17 uh, on his stats. So we can't possibly do that much better than we did all those playoffs and that's what the frustrating part was but as for celebrating I think iconic kind of players that we had for Peoria I think it was just a phenomenal year so I look at every every year as a great year no matter what just because there's so many things that happens in the year that you know we get a chance to celebrate great moments and I always say we all get older we're all going to pass away one time but if we can celebrate uh, you know, those players or what we do in Peoria with our fans, with our, you know, I call them my friends and my families, but with our fans in Peoria, uh, I, I think it's just great memories that was going to last forever. Absolutely. And such great players deserve a strong support system, a professional style support system. You know, I know you go on and on about the staff you had uh, behind the scenes, Trevor McClure, our equipment manager, Allison Beasley, our athletic trainer this year, both there in their first years here with Peoria. How good was the family dynamic in the locker room, not just the players and coaching staff, but also as well, the support staff as well? You know, I, I'll be honest, for years I've been lucky. I've had phenomenal staffs, and you're always a little nervous when you get two new people, but um, if if people understand how much they do, and that's why you hear interviews in the NHL, a lot of people talk about their trainers or athletic trainers, because, mm -hmm. you know, celebrate players. We celebrate coaches. We celebrate, you know, a lot of things, but we always forget it all the people that do the most work, you know, the background work. And I've seen my staff, you know, stay at the ring for 18 hours on game day. They don't leave for 18 hours. Everything's prepared to a T. Uh, they take care. Allison is still taking care of some of our injured players now. Um, she, like there's so much they do in the background to make sure that wheel just kind of, you know, there's no, no squeaky wheel anymore. It just goes perfectly because of those people, everything's in place. And I can't say enough, man, for without them, I always say I'm nothing either because they do so much for me that I can just focus on what we do well as a coaching staff, not with hags, but it's so nice to have people that, you know, do all that little work that we can just focus on what we do well. And that's why I always say our organization is always just kind of, flowing as the year goes on because of these type of people so for allison and trevor i can't say enough but we have a lot of helpers that come in the locker room also that people don't realize on game day it's a lot of work for those people so you know pickles and all those guys that i you know love to death what they do is phenomenal and then rougher you can't forget you you're with us on the road you know people always think that we go on the road and it's glamorous life in the hotel but when people i <laughs> <laughs> got the 40-hour bus trip yeah, they don't see guys doing, you know, hours of bus trip while being on their computers and trying to cut highlights with bad internet service and anything oh. that we can. So I, I think, um, you know, we're lucky to have everything we have in Peoria from, you know, from you, from Trevor, from everybody that helps out to make sure that our, our organization is always one of the top ones in the, in the league every single year.
Speaking on that bus trip, now that it's long in the rearview mirror, what are you most uh, taking away from that 40-hour bus trip in the first round of the playoffs, trying to get home from Pensacola to Peoria? A lot of stress. <laughs> <laughs> really tired. Uh, still couldn't believe the players wanted to play that game and won that game against Pensacola. I still can't believe the enthusiasm that we had while we were, you know, on the side of the road playing whatever spike ball or whatever we were playing the four, four square, at four square or whatever for hours and still guys laughing and having fun. And, uh, you know, people don't realize we didn't have air conditioning either the whole 40 hours on that, those buses. Um, and just to come in, get in at 1 PM or whatever, eat quick lunch and then play a game that night was Phenomenal, but that's, you know, I always say if you're going to write a book one day, those are the stories that are going to be interesting because, you know, the laughs or <laughs> I wanted to cry a few times that we had on that road trip can write a great chapter. Zach Wilkie already has the chapter title all written out. It's not appropriate for me to say on this program, but he already has the chapter title written out. <laughs> I'm sure because we, uh, you know, for the boys to make it, that just shows you the type of leadership and the type of players and the type of people we have because, um, to be honest with you, when I was a player, I wouldn't have been happy, and I probably would have folded pretty quick on that one. But these guys just stayed up, and I think as a group, we were 25, 26 people on that bus trip that kind of kept encouraging each other and putting smiles on each other's face, and that's what a team's all about. You spend a lot of time not only with the Peoria Riverman, but also with Peoria Mustangs and Peoria Youth Hockey Association. You're running a lot of camps in the summer. What is it about working with youth and junior hockey players that is so fulfilling for you personally because you're getting a blank picture um at the pro level um you know it's it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks they say and you still try and you do your best but once you get those blank pictures you can kind of mold them into not only the player you want but also the person you want uh, you become not only a hockey coach you become a teacher you become a mentor um, you're with them for years. So it's not like the room and, you know, every player, which they should, they want to move up. They want to play at the highest level. So you don't know if you're going to get them for two months, if you're going to get them for a year, if you're going to get, you know, you never know with these kids, you kind of know you're going to get them for a while so you can mold them and do the right things. And if, you know, I've always, um, I, I think it was installed in me by my dad, but I always want to make people proud. I want to make sure they get everything they can out of what I can offer and for me that's why I'm so um I don't know I'm so attached to the process of making those kids better because if I see one thing that's not doing well I want to make sure they do it well to give themselves the best chance possible not only to play at the highest level but to love our sport I, I believe that it's the best sport in the world and if I can create that passion for other kids to love it as much as I do I think I did my job because, you know, they all want to be thought, they all want to be pushed, and they want all want to belong to something bigger than themselves. And when you have a, a chance to play in a team sport or to be in a team camp in the summer with 30 other kids on the ice, I think you gain a lot of confidence, you gain a lot of personality out of it, and I think every kid is going to grow out of it. So for me, it's the process of taking that blank picture and making it a good person, a good player, and, you know, a, a guy that's going to be motivated to attack life and do the best they can with what they have. You know, you hear a lot about coaching trees. I mean, you have your own coaching tree that's being sprouted here in the SPHL with Dan Bremner and Dave Shinitsny and Roanoke and Quad City, respectively. Alec Hagman now coming in as an associate head coach. I'm sure he'll eventually get a head coaching job down the line. But when you look at you yourself, what were some of the coaches that had a big impact on you and your coaching style and your philosophy in terms of how you not only coach the game, but also teach the game to players. Um, Actually, there's a few and it, it's a big spectrum. I got my first one. His name was Bob Mongray and he was my head coach and major junior. I came in as a 19 year old. And to be honest with you, I didn't have the warrior instinct. I, I, I was a pretty good player. But I didn't I, I didn't have that fuse that, you know, that juice that you need every single day. I didn't have the mental strength to accept injuries and play through it. I had a lot of things I was missing to my game. And I feel like my two years with Bob and our assistant coach was Claude Julien that closed to the NHL for years. He was our assistant coach and they were hard nosed kind of coaches. 
uh, fair, hard nose, but they would not allow you to make an excuse for anything. And I think that's where I got my strength and my be ready to do whatever it takes in a game as a player and as a coach. I think that's where I learned that, you know, if you really want to push through anything, you can. It's just a matter of mindset and doing the right things every single day to take care of yourself and you'll be able to. So those that Bob Mongray was really big and Claude Julien as assistant coach. And I was lucky in Houston. And I don't get me wrong. I had tons of great coaches, but the ones that really changed me, I thought Todd McClellan in Houston that now coaches for the LA Kings. And um, he taught me a lot of communication. Um, he was a great communicator, making you understand why, where, how, and the reason for it. And I'll always forget that. We had a great meeting one day and he explained to me how he sees a team and why because um, because I I was kind of a low maintenance guy. He knew that um, hard work did not have to be taught to me. I was just doing it every single day. So for us, the low maintenance guys, he was telling me why he does certain things with us that he doesn't really worry about us because he knows we're going to bring it every single day. And he was explaining in the next group of five, there they ha he had a name for everybody on the team groups to know how to push, how to do things to get to squeeze the most juice possible out of them. So. And he did that a lot. We had so many meetings. He was a great communicator and a great coach uh, at what he did. And then my last one, to be honest with you, and this might come as a surprise, but um, I had a chance to meet Christian Mayer about three years ago. And um, he's bringing me a different mindset, especially for my youth hockey and junior players. Um, you know, at the pro level, it's all about winning all the time. And Mm -hmm. Of course, I'm a kid. I'm a guy that loves to develop. I love to teach new things. I'm really, really big on little things of the game. But he came to me with a different mindset on how to understand the athlete, more of the psychology, I would say, of an athlete. And I think, you know, he's been sending us books and all kinds of things to kind of reel. And I've been reading a lot of things the last three, four years to kind of understand more of when to push, when to squeeze when to lay off the gas, how to communicate, how to do things. And he's been a great asset for my life. And I talk to him probably weekly uh, because I want to make my, you know, the youth hockey program the best as we can. And he, he runs the whole mission program, which is the top five, probably triple A program in the country. So for me, he's been a, I know I will never tell him that and he doesn't know this, but he's been influencing me in the right way to kind of change my mindset on different things. So I really enjoy my conversations with him. That's right, because getting in touch with the modern youth hockey player, the modern kids, basically, the younger generation, quote unquote, is, is so imperative. And, you know, for people to stay relevant, sometimes they have to adapt. And I think that's one of the reasons that you're one of the best, if not the best coach in this league, the John Cooper of the SPHL, as I sometimes call you <laughs> in private conversation. I, I love when you say that because I really do think John's the best coach in the NHL and the way player so if i can have a tenth of his career i'll be pretty happy so i uh no and you're right I, that's one thing i pride myself uh, you know i told you this before every single day i watch one conference a day you know even if it's uh system wise psychology wise whatever i need to do to get better as a coach because like i told you before i got ingrained that i don't want to disappoint people i want to give them everything i can to make sure and i always say leaving your legacy is for a lifetime and when I pass away, I want, you know, to be had a chance to kind of mold people and to become better people, better person, better family members, better husbands. So whatever I can do to try to make myself better, because if you want to change the world, you got to change yourself first. So for me, I try to learn every single day and become a better man so I can teach people to do the right things. Wonderful. Last question for you, Guy, before I let you go. We all know you're a big hard worker. You're a big work hard, play hard guy. So I got to ask now that it's summer, what is your ideal weekend vacation outside of hockey? No responsibilities. You can do whatever you want with whoever you want. What's your ideal summer weekend outside of hockey? That's tough. I never, I never get to relax my brain. So you can ask Angie that she, she gets mad at me even when <laughs> movie. I'm still doing hockey on the, on the side, but I would love to go with a few great couple friends. I mean, like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, have couples, the wives and the husbands. And for sure, I would have golf in there at one point. For sure, I would have fishing in there at one point. Uh, for sure, I would have a nice glass of whiskey with, with the boys and the wives at some point. 
Uh, we would be eating for sure crab legs and filet mignon. That's for sure. <laughs> I think at night around a nice fire, telling stories, laughing really loud, not caring how loud you get and mm -hmm. having a few glasses of wines and relaxing and and just enjoying my friendships and, you know, uh, Angie. So for me, I, I'm not really that high maintenance, except maybe the, you know, the crab legs and lobster tails or maybe a little bit more. But <laughs> I love to be around friends and family and and just you know, talk, tell stories, communicate. Uh, but I do love golfing. I haven't done a lot in the last seven years. Uh, we have a lot of kids at home, so we haven't done a lot of that. But And I haven't done a lot of fishing. But somewhere in Canada or Minnesota where you can, you can get some big walleye, uh, nice salmon maybe, and then kind of cook that roasted at night on the fire would be pretty special, really a lot of fun. So You go to Lake me, Michigan and get some good salmon there. Oh, I might go somewhere, make, get some blueberries, some salmon. I might there you some, go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I got a vacation plan here with one of my buddies. I won't tell his name. Uh, <laughs> oh, somewhere. Sounds good. Sounds good. <laughs> Gee, thanks so much for your time. We'll let you get back to your mobile office. We'll talk to you later on in the off season. Keep it, keep it up and keep enjoying it, my friend. Ruffer, I never tell you enough, but thanks for everything you do for us, buddy. We appreciate it. I love you, buddy.